All right. So how are you feeling right now as a homeowner? Are you stressed? Are you concerned? Are you intimidated? Are you anxious? Probably all of the above. Uh, it's been an interesting market the last couple months. As most of you may be aware, interest rates have dropped a full point in the last five months. And then the feds have started doing their thing. And if I had a nickel for every conversation I had, what the feds are doing versus mortgages, I'd be a very rich man. But it's an interesting time. It's a phenomenal time to buy. And Emily will go into more detail about that. So let us move forward. So this seminar, who is this for? Well, ideally, it's for growing families, people that have maybe need a larger home or want that office that they didn't have when they originally bought. Obviously, empty nesters such as myself selling a big home, buying something smaller, and how does that work? And how often do I have to move? And all those great questions. Uh, po potentially job relocations. A lot of people are moving to Washington for jobs right now. Uh, renovation. Maybe you're tired of working on your house and you'd like to get something that's complete, whether it's new or not. Uh, there's a lot of different options right now. What we want to do is avoid potentially having two house payments. And if you're first time seller, what does that mean? And what's available for me? And what education can I learn? So that's just some of the things that we're going to be discussing today. So Emily, why don't we uh, why don't we start with some of the challenges that sellers may be looking at as far as uh, different ideas of things that perhaps they hadn't even thought of? Yeah, absolutely, David. Thank you so much. I would say that when I speak with people in the real estate industry, clients who are just getting started, everybody is excited about buying a home. They have their eyes on the future. They're looking on, online at all the different houses and they are getting pumped up. They love the home search or the thrill of the chase. But the part that we don't talk about as much because it's kind of a pain point is how do we sell the home that they're exiting. How do we get everything cleaned up, packed up, tidy up the house so it looks amazing and sells for top dollar? And how do we time all of that? What are the logistics? Do we shop for the new home first? Do we have to sell the old house to get our equity out? It just becomes um, kind of a little bit more sticky and hard to work with. So it be, it's a, a mystery and we're going to get into that black box today and kind of unlock that for people because I think that depending on your circumstance, there are different strategies that we can use to address this. But at the end of the day, uh, we want you to know that there are solutions and David and I are here to be a resource for you so that you can start to put this plan in place and we can help you kind of decide which direction to go in as you move forward with uh, getting into that new property. That's a fantastic overview. Thank you. And so a little bit about myself. I've been in the mortgage business for 38 years. And uh, yes, I started on stone tablets. That's correct. And uh, I'm here for one, one reason and one reason only, and that's to advise buyers and sellers. The picture you're currently looking at is uh, three of our seven grandkids, and they keep me young. And um, it, it's a reason I keep doing what I'm doing, because uh, when I started many, many years ago, I got in the business for two reasons. Unlimited income. You can earn as much as you're willing to work. And as corny or as old-fashioned as it sounds, I do truly believe in home ownership. Uh, it changes people's family lives forever. Uh, now, if you want to know the uh, <laughs> the boring part, I, I've done a close over 2,500 loans, been in the business a long time. And I see our role um, as advisors. And we're very fortunate that Emily is with us today because she's one of the best of the best. And what I love about her is that she believes that education is can be a difference. And, and that's one of the reasons that we're working together. So Emily, why don't you go ahead and take a little bit from here and let's find out more about you. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, David. I am I am the big toothy smile person here on the left. I'm with one of my clients. We sold her house, her condo actually in Shoreline and got her moved into another property. She was a traveling nurse and she wanted to go to Texas and so helped make that happen. But, you know, as with you, I love the connection and the people side of things and just finding out what your goals are and helping you get there. I actually started in real estate 
right out of college. I was in North Carolina. I had gotten a Fulbright scholarship down there in economics, and I was um, eager to buy property. My father was a real estate investor. My grandfather was a real estate investor. And so I got started in real estate investing, buying single family homes. Uh, went from there into syndications, shopping centers, apartment buildings, land deals. And then um, eventually I got married. My husband was in IT and I convinced him to come back here to Seattle, live nearby to my family and um, got him into a little job in Amazon. So that all worked out very well for us. Um, but I have been in real estate as kind of in my blood since the beginning. And I just really enjoy the connection that comes from helping families um, buy and sell real estate. It's, it's a really fun and engaging process. And like you said, uh, the education, the consultation is really um, what makes it rewarding for me. Wow, that's fantastic. I even learned a couple more things about you. <laughs> so real estate mistakes, what are they? Um, not being educated to the current market is a big one. People hear or read or assume certain things. Um, being surprised by the cost to actually sell a home and buy a home, what are they and who pays them? Uh, some people may think that they can be their own agent. We'll certainly talk about that. And then having a strategy of transitioning, whether you're buying a place, selling a place, or trying to do both is really important. And then if you don't prepare for this, what does that actually mean? And I think one of the most important things that we're going to talk about today is we're going to throw an awful lot of things uh, out for you. And the whole idea is we want to show you an overview. And after you've had the chance to listen to this class or watch this class, ideally, we'd love you to set up a one-on-one -on -one call or meeting with either one of us or both. We're here to provide information, but then we can specifically talk about what is appropriate for you and your family. So let's start with uh, number one, not being educated on the current market. Uh, Emily, you want to give us an overview? Yeah, absolutely. So David and everybody listening, as I mentioned, I studied economics. That's what my degree is in, and it really overlays perfectly with understanding the dynamics of the real estate market. Now, a lot of people listen to the news. We hear a lot of national headlines about things that are happening in real estate, but real estate is very local. And so when we hear those national headlines, they may or may not actually reflect what's going on in Seattle. So one of the first things that I like to do with my clients when they're anticipating a move, whether it's you know a year out or a month out, is to look at and help them understand the dynamics of our Seattle real estate market. Here on this graph, for example, I pulled this data from one of the tools I have access to called HomeBot. And you're, I can get you a, a link to this as well. We have a subscription, it actually tracks the value of your house and also the real estate market performance in your specific neighborhood. And as you can see uh, toward the top of the graph, it's easier to sell. That's what we call a seller's market. Typically homes are selling in just a month or two here in Seattle. And as we see, you know, maybe in 2008 with the times of market crash, it can take longer to sell a home. It can take three, four, five months to sell a home. And we would consider that a buyer's market. That's when buyers have the advantage um, of a little bit more negotiating power. So the challenge, you know, in this context, we're talking about moving up, selling one home and buying another. So you're actually wearing both hats. You're wearing the seller hat and you're wearing the buyer hat. So in a seller's market, when things are moving very quickly, it can be very easy to sell your home. Maybe we'll sell your home in one or two weeks. You'll have a month to move and then that's it. How do you then become a buyer? I've had buyers that weren't willing to make offers that were high and aggressive. They wanted to be conservative and they would make an offer every weekend, every weekend. And they, they weren't getting a home under contract because we had multiple offers and the market was very competitive. So when we're doing this transition, this move from one home to another, it helps to understand where we are in this market because that impacts the strategy that you want to use. And I will say that, um, we have, we have tools and strategies in which you can sell your home first or in which you can buy your home first. And depending on 
the type of market that we're in, one strategy over the other might be more effective. Uh, so right now, just to give you an idea in Seattle here, we're seeing that uh, homes are typically selling within one or two months. Uh, the average prices are going up a little bit, but we do have seasonal fluctuations. So the strongest seller's market typically is in spring. We have another kind of echo of that in autumn, September, October. And then things are typically a little softer at the winter time, it's dark, it's rainy, it's the holidays, people don't want to move during that time. And also in the summer when it's great weather and everyone's out at the lake and going on vacation and they forgot that they were also in the market for a home. So depending again on what type of, if you're leaning into a seller's market or you're wanting a little bit more soft market, that uh, timing of when you do this transition can also help you select what type of competition you wanna be going up against. That's a really good point because a lot of people don't realize uh, we're currently, it's October right now, and I have some buyers looking and the inventory is a little bit lower, but they have much less competition. So that, those are really good points. Um, why don't we talk about the market overall right now, uh, Emily? Yeah. So one of the things I love, David, about meeting with you is every time we meet, you tell me a new statistic from the MLS and you're not even a realtor, you're a lender, but you're on top of it. And um, I think both of us <laughs> like data enough that that's kind of a, a shared enthusiasm. So uh, the key with sharing data and statistics is in the interpretation. How does this impact us? So for example, right now, one of the things that you shared the last time we met was that um, you had noticed the percentage of homes that were selling for cash, like all cash offers coming in, no financing, that type of a thing uh, was 31%. And um, some people feel like they can't compete against cash offers, but that's actually not the case. I've sat with sellers who are getting multiple offers on their property and the majority, I would say 90% or more, um, the, the seller does not care whether you're getting a loan or not. They just want to know how much money is going to be coming to them at the end of the day. If people, uh, if buyers have a good lender behind them and they're getting financing, it's not a big detriment to you to have to compete against a cash offer. So I don't want you to hear these statistics and make it feel like you're getting knocked out of contention here. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, that's a question I get asked quite a bit. How can we compete, which we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, a cash buyer. So exactly what Emily said, to a seller, loan cash, money is money. What they want to really look for is, can you put yourself in a position as a buyer to eliminate as many contingencies as possible? And if I've done my job up front, you are truly pre-approved, You've been under, underwritten by a live underwriter, and literally the only thing we need is an appraisal. And in the cycle that we try to compete with, I won't say all, but a high percentage of the loans are have on average about a 30-day closing. I always go in with the idea that we want to close 10 days early, or that's my mindset. So if we have all your documentation and we've received everything, other than locking in the loan and the appraisal, I'm basically done. And then there are different options regarding those contingencies. Some people may waive financing, and that's kind of an individual decision. And Emily will um, talk specifically to those buyers at that time as myself. Uh, some people waive the appraisal, which is something you can consider. But right now, if I order an appraisal today on a rush, I'll have it in about four days. So we can tailor those purchase offers as strong, if not stronger than a cash deal. So that's important to know that that option is in fact available for potential buyers and sellers. So I'm sorry, Dave, Emily, go ahead. Before you, can you go back to that slide and just talk a little bit about the amount of work that you do up front when someone comes to you, oh, you're okay. not just, you know, typing in their income and seeing what kind of a loan they can get. You're you're mm -hmm. looking at documents, you're going into the research right. so that if you give them a letter, they know they can count on that financing. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I, I sometimes forget the amount of work that we do for that. So thank you. Um, yeah, when, when we have a new loan, 
beside looking at all the paperwork to be sure what we say and do is in fact there, part of what I do as a certified mortgage advisor is I'm going to tailor that loan to the potential buyer's short-term and long-term financial goals. Sometimes going 20% down is their best interest. Sometimes paying off debt is in their best interest. So there is no one way fits all. And if you're self-employed, that opens up a whole different avenue from the standpoint of how much money are you making? What is your debt structure? How long have you been making the money? So not only am I satisfying the approval, but I'm really educating the potential buyer to different programs and options. And then whatever's best for them and their family, that's what we do. But I find my role is educating them to all the different choices Because there's nothing worse, and Emily will attest to this, when you're in the heat of battle and making offers, that's not a good time to figure out what I can or can't do or what I can or cannot afford. We want all that done ahead of time. So when you're working with Emily and she's making an offer, between the two of it's the best position we can put you in to get your shot at the ultimate goal of buying a home. So thanks Absolutely. for, thanks for reminding Yeah. me. I sometimes forget some of the things that I do for that. So let's talk about home selling costs. What are they? What are some options, Emily? So there are a couple of different ways to look at this. The, the costs that everybody thinks of are kind of their closing costs, which come at the end of the sale. Escrow gives you a check and you're saying, oh, okay, I'm paying for escrow. I'm paying for title insurance. I'm, I'm, paying those costs of closing. And we can estimate those. We actually can provide you a statement with estimates for all of that. But before you get there, I want you to just consider having a budget for the home improvement and getting it looking nice before you sell. Like Just like if you were selling your car. Right now, I have a, a van that's 20 years old. It probably has you know food ground into it from when my kids were toddlers. It hasn't been through the, the car wash, right? My son drives it to school. It's probably got a few scratches on the bumper. Uh, but that, if I were selling that car, I would clean it. I would detail it. I would get the vacuum and I would get all the, the crumbs out from between the seats. And it's the same thing with our house. We live in a house in one way and one level of cleanliness, one level of repair. But when we're getting it ready to put onto the market, we do a lot of things to spiff it up. Sometimes clients get a little bit over eager and they say, I have always wanted to remodel this kitchen and change the orientation of the counters and put in a window so that I could look out into the yard. Do you think I should do that before we sell the home? And for the most part, the answer is no. When you're selling the home, unless it's a real expensive neighborhood, like you're in Kirkland or Bellevue and it's a one and a half million dollar home where you're in a luxury price point, it typically does not make sense to remodel the home. It just makes sense to bring it up to standard. And we can talk about that, but I don't want you to get carried away with doing a lot of aspirational home improvement projects because uh, the National Association of Realtors has actually done research on this and there are very few home improvement projects that pay for themselves. Meaning you might put $50,000 into a remodel, but it might only get you 40,000 or 30,000 in increased sales price. So I don't want you to overspend remodeling your home in anticipation of a sale. What I do want you to do is get it cleaned up, have it washed, uh, have a handyman over and bring things up to par. And I actually invest in these things on your behalf. That's part of my property preparation package because I really believe that having your home up and ready to roll makes a huge difference when sellers see the pictures and walk through the property. It makes it the obvious choice, something that they want to buy and buy quickly. No, that's a very good, you don't want to spend money just for the sake of spending the money. That's a really good point. Yeah. Let's talk about, does it make sense to, you know, in a hot market to buy or sell a home without an agent? Uh, this has been a hot topic recently because of all of the uh, commission conversations that are happening nationwide. Um, here in Washington, we are not involved in the National Association of Realtors Settlement and our MLS has not bought into that. So we are pretty separate. And the good news is that we adopted a lot of the new best practices 
years ago. So um, again, this is a case of listening to national headlines, but not knowing whether they apply here locally. Uh, of course, for you know, as long as uh, as long as we've been around, people have been open to selling, welcome to sell without uh, listing with a real estate agent. Uh, and based on independent research, uh, these FISBO sellers tend to net the same amount or less than they would have if they had listed with a realtor. This is a picture of a house that I sold this year in Richmond Beach, kind of an older home, and it was an estate sale property, but it had a great view of the Sound and the Olympic Mountains. And uh, the, the owner had put it on the market himself for sale by owner and was just not getting any activity. I think he listed it for $1.4 million. And uh, I had talked with him before he did that. He didn't end up listing it with me. He tried to pick my brain and then do everything on his own. And then um, <laughs> after that didn't work, he called me and we changed the marketing. We changed the pricing. We changed the presentation. We packed it full of sellers. I'm sorry, we packed it full of buyers at the open house. We generated multiple offers and we send it up, we ended up selling it for 1.48 million. It did not appraise for that high, but we were able to help the, the buyer. Um, they were getting a loan. We helped them get, get things squared away so that they could in fact close at full price above appraised value and above the price that he was trying to sell it for on his own. And um, so I think he and I were both very pleased with that result, but it was a very stark indication of the same product, the same time of year um, presented with an, without an agent just makes a huge difference. That's a really good point. So if you're a buyer, there are a lot of things you don't even think about as potentials. So this is kind of an overview. If you want to touch on a couple of points, yeah, so most people, most buyers do choose to use an agent as well. And um, some people think that they're going to save money or save time if they approach a seller or the seller's agent without their own representation. Uh, but again, we have a lot of research and studies on this, and uh, it's not actually preferred by the sellers in a lot of cases. It creates some liability issues for them. But you as an unrepresented buyer may very well end up overpaying for a home. There are a lot of legal issues in terms of you're not licensed to be able to use our standard MLS forms. You don't have access to them if you're unrepresented. And we as licensed real estate agents um, are not allowed to just give them to you for free. So you might have to hire a, an attorney or have some legal intermediaries there. Um, and then as far as just doing your due diligence understanding the costs. There's a lot of education and a lot of ways that that things can go wrong here. Um, every deal is different. I even, you know, after all my years in this business, David, I still find myself learning things and having to research things on a case by case basis with different deals. And I'm in the market as a full time, what, seven days a week agent. Um, if you're only doing this once every five or 10 years, I think it would be really difficult to keep up with things and, and be adequately protected. Yeah, that's a really good point. I remind people that I'm not on salary. I'm here to advise you. And after you've bought a home and after you've closed, then and only then do I get paid for my time just like you. So it's something that occasionally needs to be reminded. So let's talk about buying and transitioning from one home to the next. And the question that get asked quite a bit is, can I buy another home without selling my home? And the answer is maybe. Uh, it depends on your equity position. Nobody wants to move twice. Nobody wants to rent out your home for a short time period. Um, there's a thing called a bridge loan, which is an opportunity that you can do. There's an opportunity called trailing primary residence, which is a, we'll talk about in just a moment. So it really comes down to equity position and cash to work with those give you the most flexibility and options. And it's important to know that well ahead of time. So as far as uh, buy before sell, there's a program called Trailing Primary Residence. And basically, if you have a 30% equity position in your home, and if you have cash other than your equity to buy a home, 
when we lend on it, the home you currently own, none of that debt has to be counted against you when you buy the new home. So it gives you quite a bit of flexibility. But like anything else, it comes down to cash to work with and what is your current equity position. So this is just one of the programs that allows you to buy another one, sell your home after the fact, and then take those proceeds, whether it's part, half, all, and pay down or pay off your new mortgage. So David, can you run us through a scenario, maybe like a case study or an example with that? Um, sure. Like, let's say, let's say I bought a house 10 years ago, I paid 500,000 for it. Now it's worth a million dollars. So I don't know, I didn't pay off any loan. I just I have 500,000 in equity there. And, um, and yeah. I have some income coming in to be able to afford a different million dollar house. What would that look like? So as in well? that example, if you had a home that was worth a million and you owed 500,000, you'd have more than 30% equity. In that example, you'd have 50%. So when you buy the new home, let's say your cash is somewhat limited and you can only go 10 or 20% down. As long as you qualify for the new home with that new down payment, you're good to go. We qualify you for one mortgage. Now, when your property sells, you have the option to pay down or pay off that new mortgage. So you, you're, you're getting the benefit of qualifying with one mortgage payment, the new one, and you're having the option to decide what you do or do not want to do after your home sells. And that's important because there's some tax consequences that are involved there. There is the cost of money. And ideally, what do you want that money that you have now received from the sale of your home to do for you? And everybody's different. So there is no one way fits all. It's, a, it's all about choices and what may financially be best for you. So this would allow me to, let's say, buy my new home in March. I could buy my new home and put all of my furniture into it. And then I would have two payments for a month or two there, perhaps. But I would be able to then clean out my old house, put it on the market in April, sell it. And then if I wanted to, I could use my 500000 equity to pay down. So that new house, I might only end up with a $500,000 loan on that as well. If yeah. I pay down the balance. It's a timing issue because the particular investor for this program, basically you would have to list your property within 30 days. Okay, so that's the, the caveat that we need to be aware of on timing is that 30 day turnaround to get right. the- Right, so it's, um, it, it, it's, you know, which way is going to be best. And the thing that's important to realize, this is just one program and one way to do that. Whether it's a bridge loan or you're buying contingent on the sale of yours, there are different options available, but every circumstance is different. So talking with an advisor, a real estate agent, and a mortgage person to give you the most options is going to be the best way to go. So we can, you're giving us a sample, but we can schedule an appointment with you and you'll find out the exact numbers and then make a couple of recommendations that you think yeah, would. It, it comes down to timing, equity, and cash to work with. Then we can work it backwards on what scenarios make the most sense. And then based on what we find, you can interpret that to how that would apply to the current market. Okay, fantastic. And um, so we'll put the link up, I guess, for how people can schedule that appointment, because it sounds like it's going to be really customized depending on their situation. 100%. That's what we're here okay. for, is to set up those one-on-ones that we can talk specifically about your circumstance. So Fantastic. we'll talk, talk just a moment against cash buyers. As, as Emily stated earlier, some sellers don't care, some do, but we can, through a variety of ways, make your offer just as competitive as a cash buyer. Now, beginning of the year versus now, I think the high point was 39% of the market was set buying in cash. Right now it's down to about 23. So it's, it's slowing down because a lot of people now, a lot of people don't know the statistic, but people that buy cash, over 35% of the people that pay cash get a new mortgage within six months or less. So they spent all this money and then they're like, hmm, 
I could use some money. So they, they end up getting a loan um, to do, whether it's things on the home or whatever from that standpoint. So there's a perception that paying cash is the answer to all. And depending on where you are in the market, that may or may not have some validity. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, I told you I started out as an investor. I was trained and was training people from stage in front of hundreds of people in real estate negotiations. And one of the things that we always like to talk about is that it's never just about one thing. The more we can add a multitude of variables into any mm -hmm. conversation from the purchase price to the type of financing to whether we're getting an inspection to how much earnest money we're giving you and when you're going to move, then we have a lot of different things to negotiate on. And sometimes we can give and take and sort of show people that we're willing to be flexible and negotiate. We're a little bit, you know, we got to stick to our guns over here, but we can really give you what you want over there. It makes it a more back and forth conversation rather than a gridlocked conversation. So cash is really only one piece of the puzzle. And I think it's a relatively small piece when you look at the the multitude of other terms and things that we can negotiate on. That brings up a really good point. So one of the things that I offer um, with the realtor and buyer's permission is I will call the listing agent, not to tell them they have $12 in the bank, but to show them all the things that we've done that how we can compete with the cash offer and that we've done our due diligence. So we're, we're supporting the listing agent being able to go back to the seller and say, well, as far as the deal with David and Emily, they're done. They've done their due diligence. They've been approved. And one of the things I just started about nine months ago is I'll talk about Emily and how great she is and a strong communicator and she knows what she's doing. It's another step that reinforces to the listing agent who represents the seller that these guys have done what they need to do and they know what they're talking about. And sometimes it makes a difference. Right. Yeah. As, as much as possible, working with an agent and a lender who know and appreciate each other, who can communicate well with themselves and the other agent, it helps us present you and your purchase package as coming from a well-oiled machine. We do this all the time. There aren't going to be hiccups. We're going to get the job done. It creates an added level of certainty in, um, you know, in a situation where the selling agent is taking a risk by taking it off the market and going with you, they don't know if you're going to perform. We're trying to show them that, yes, absolutely, this is going to close. Please come work with our client. Yeah, that's a good point. Emily, yeah. you want to talk a, a quick overview on kind of the steps to selling a home? Yeah, absolutely. And this is me, another uh, fun picture with a townhouse in the back that I sold near Green Lake there. And um, this was an interesting situation. It was a buy and a sell. And um, so it reminded me of, of you know what we're talking about here on this webinar. The first step is to find a real estate agent. And so many people call me and say, we're ready to list the home next week. Uh, let's go do your thing. I encourage people to call me weeks, months, or years in advance of when they know that they're going to be selling so we can enter into the conversation. There is a lot that goes on, like I talked about property prep, timing, especially if you're doing a buy and sell, timing becomes even more important. And there's just a lot of value that I can offer in those weeks and months leading up to putting the property on the market. So I never want you to feel like it's too early to... Um, meet with me, have me come out to the house, ask me what condition, you know, it needs to be in. I had a client in Everett who, you know, thought maybe there was an oil tank and we had to, to think about how to handle that. She wanted to know if she should remodel her kitchen and what she should do in the basement and so on. And I really welcome those conversations because you as the seller need to have the time and the money to tackle some of these projects or not. And having that lead time, I think is very helpful. So after we do that, uh, can you just go back for a moment there, David? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. I think um, getting the timeline in place is the next thing. Ideally, wave your magic wand. When are you selling? When are you buying? How is that going to work out? And then we can work backward from there in terms of what I'm doing to invest in the home, what the handyman is doing, what the cleaners are doing, what the stagers are doing. Does it need paint and carpet? Any of those projects combined with your move, your furniture, your um, family lifestyle so that we can really do a lot of work before just putting it on the market. A lot of the work, uh, it's kind of like that 
what 90% of the iceberg that's below water that you don't see. That's all the work that we do as agents before we bring the property to market. So I, I encourage you not to hesitate to bother me or waste my time. Feel free to call early and often and um, I'll, I'm here to partner with you and help you as you kind of go through that pain in the neck part, the hassle part of, of getting the property ready to go. Those are some great points. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I want to address stage. So some people do stage properties. Uh, some people don't. I am selling a condo right now in Kenmore who uh, the, the, it, it was an expired listing and it had the person's own furniture in it. They had some cell phone photos taken. They had some accent walls that were dark green and it just looked like, um, something that no one wanted to come and visit. It only had six uh, people come and visit it, even though it was a relatively strong market. And um, so we took that off the market. We painted out the dark green accent walls. We fully staged it. We got the professional photographer in there and it looks like a completely different property. We just went on the market today, so I don't have results yet, but I'm fully confident that it will make a huge difference in the response that the marketplace has to this property. So if your home is vacant, studies from the National Association of Realtors show that staging the home can increase the sales price from one to 6%. Some studies show more. It also helps the home sell faster. It is an investment. If Again, if your home is vacant, this is something that I will do as part of my listing package for you. If your home is not vacant and you're living in there, we're working with your furniture, we'll help consult with you to help you understand, you know, this huge couch, maybe that should go into storage. Uh, maybe we need to move things around a little bit differently to make the home seem light, bright, and spacious, which is really what buyers are looking for. And that's a really good point because... If you've been living in a property for a while, you have a perspective. Yes. And when you're a buyer, it's completely different. Exactly. And those buyers are tough comparison shoppers. They are going mm -hmm. into the properties. You know, they've seen 20 properties by the time they get to yours and they can immediately tell, you know, if it's if it's hot or not. <laughs> and if it's not, they're just like, uh, why are we here? Let's move on. This is another option, another example uh, of virtual staging. So if your home were filled with clutter, for example, we could virtual stage it to eliminate that. And one of the properties that I had that was an estate sale, they had a lot of items. They didn't have a lot of time and money and resources to get that cleaned up. Um, like they thought they would. <laughs> and so um, they stuffed everything in a closet. We took a picture and the photographer was able to Photoshop those items out of the closet. So it looked a little bit more light, bright and open. Um, and then conversely, we can show this is what it would look like with furniture in it. So uh, there are a lot of Photoshop options. The MLS does limit, you know, we have to represent what's going on. We can't pretend it's a castle when it's a hovel. Uh, we, we disclose all of these things, but it just helps people form an emotional attachment to be able to see themselves in the property and see the potential that the property has to look fantastic. Yeah, that's a really, and that's important because 99% of the people are shopping on the internet before they ever go out to look at a property. Right. Okay. The cost of selling your, on your own, what does that mean? Good, bad, otherwise, let's talk specifically Whoops, not sure why I did that. Okay, there we go. Emily, you want to touch bases on this? Yeah, fantastic. So the cost of selling on your own, we touched on this a little bit before on our for sale by owner slide, um, but there are just a lot of risks and liabilities. Uh, real estate is, is a very litigious industry. <laughs> All of us real estate agents have errors and omissions insurance that covers us and, um, Every week, I used to get on a Zoom call every week with my broker and she would be telling us all of the mistakes that people were making, all of the lawsuits that people were having. And so it's just something that you need to proceed with caution on. Um, even, you know, seller's disclosures, if you, Washington State requires disclosures to be made. If you fudge the details on the condition of your property or fail to disclose the accurate condition of your property, sellers can come, I'm sorry, buyers can come back to you 
uh, months and years in the future, that risk survives closing. It's not just something that you can say, oh, I sold, it's on them now. They can actually come back and sue you. Um, and again, uh, so that's one issue, sort of the, the legal and liability ramifications. And then there's the lack of knowledge. You're not understanding the market. You know, you might look at comps, but comps in February have different implications than comps in May. And again, comps in October, you might be looking at, you know, where the market was, but you need to understand where the market is going. And that can have an impact based on seasonality, based on interest rates, based on other things like presidential elections. There are a whole host of factors uh, that can affect what's going on with pricing. And if you don't get pricing correct, um, it can really be to the detriment of your home if... Uh, sellers, I will just say sellers tend to overprice their homes. It's like, you know, my baby is the cutest. My dog is the cutest. And my house is the most valuable house on the whole block. Uh, that's just our bias. That's our tendency. It's the way we think. So um, having that outside person to tell you how to price, how to clean, how to get rid of the smell <laughs> and how to protect yourself through the process, I think is really important. Those are really good points. It's it's sort of like on my side, I get the everybody's trying to guess when the rates are going to hit the bottom. Nobody right. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. So many you of know. us, I think, here are data oriented. We've got the big tech industry. Everyone wants to time the market. But as they say in real estate, time in the market is much more important than timing the market. And mm -hmm. I had so many clients over the last couple of years say, oh, I wish we had bought two years ago when we first started looking. And, um, you know, we thought we would time the market and we waited and it turned out not to pay off. So um, it's also important. We haven't talked about this much yet, but marketing the home is increasingly important, especially if it's not a, you know, this home sold in two days type of a property with, you know, 10, mm -hmm. 10 offers over ask price, right? That was the case at one point, but that's not the case necessarily anymore. And so what is your agent doing besides getting the property on the market? In my case, we create top of the line marketing collateral, and then we actually distribute it out everywhere. We use um, paid advertisements, we use mailings, we use door knocking, like some of these old fashioned things still work. And in fact, they're very effective because uh, not very many people are willing to do what I call work, David. <laughs> they're, you know, they're they're busy getting their manicure and their hair colored and they, they forgot to work on selling your property. So I really think it's uh, important to focus on marketing the property, getting it out in front of buyers and having a way of engaging people in the excitement and enthusiasm for your property who may be you know, on vacation, not scrolling through the MLS that week. But if they knew about your property, if they knew you know, something was for sale next door to their parents or their best friend or down the street from their job or their kid's school, if they knew that that was available, they would have been interested. It's our job to let them know that that's the case. That's a really, really good point because I get a lot of buyers that literally will ask me, this home's been for sale for a week and they haven't had five offers. What's wrong with it? So having been around the block a few times, I have to explain to them that that's not normal. Just because it's for sale for more than a week doesn't mean anything's wrong with it. It means it's, it's going through the cycle of a home and what it should do. Yeah, it could mean that somebody put it on the market on a Sunday instead of on a Thursday, or it could mean that there was a Seahawks game or a rainy weekend or something like that. But um, I actually work with a lot of buyers as well as sellers, and uh, they typically search on kind of a variety of parameters. They all start uh, using these technology tools, right? They kind of create a radius around typically uh, their work their family and their hobbies, kind of creating a triangle that they'd like to live in. And then they look at price and they say, uh oh, well, I better I better live farther out than that. <laughs> yeah. um, and then they're also looking at uh, size, layout, condition of the home. This is a huge one. So many people and David, you can probably attest to this. Um, you know, they, they might start by saying, you know, I'm pre-qualified to buy a home for $800,000, but I looked at that monthly payment. I don't want to make a payment that that's that high. I'd rather shop for something that's six or $700,000. And after they get out into the market, they 
they find, wow, you know, just for that extra hundred thousand, I can get such a nicer home. Like all of the cute homes are just out of my price range. And so they creep up toward the top of the, the amount that they're qualified for. And most people end up buying pretty close to their maximum um, borrowing amount. But what that means is that they don't have a lot of extra funds available to then remodel your home once they've moved in. You can't assume that buyers uh, have the money to put in all new carpet and all new paint. You know, so many people are like, oh yeah, all my walls are purple and black, but I'll just let the buyers repaint it because, you know, then they'll choose the colors that they like. And I guess what I'm here to say is that they don't necessarily have the time and the money to do those things. So it's incumbent upon us as sellers to do them or else risk, um, you know, taking a significant haircut when it comes to uh, how much people are willing to pay for it, because a lot of buyers just don't have the capacity to do that. No, that's a really good point. The um, buyers that come in with me, in your example, if they say they want a payment up to 700000 but they can afford eight fifty. I tell them that. I think it's important for them to know what their options are well before they start uh, negotiating, and even more importantly, before they start looking. Because if they can't afford eight hundred thousand and they're looking at eight hundred thousand, going back and looking at seven hundred thousand dollar homes, not fun. Not right. Fun. Okay, let's talk about uh, the all important. What is my house worth? Yeah. So getting the pricing right is a huge factor in selling your home quickly. And I, I typically tell people, like, you know, we we talked about this a little bit with the idea that every seller thinks their home is the most beautiful home and it should sell for a lot. So there's a lot of temptation to set the price high. And they tell me, hey, Emily, you know, I really like my price of $1.5 million. And I realized that the neighborhood is selling for 1.3 million, but I did upgrade my kitchen. So I really like 1.5, let's put it on the market there. And then if it doesn't sell, you know, maybe we can reduce it down the road or maybe someone will just come along and offer me 1.3 if that's if that's what the market price is and I can negotiate with them right I mean it makes sense if you're not a realtor or if you're not in the market it's it's a logical thing to think but I don't know if it's um just our culture here I don't see a lot of people choosing to come in and lowball sellers because oftentimes it doesn't work mm -hmm. sellers don't respond like there's just there's not this openness to like haggle over these things um, I've done it. I I said I'm, I'm an investor. I started out as a very cheapskate type of investor, and I loved coming in and you know lowballing people, and that was kind of the order of the day. But a, a lot of people get you know the fur up on the back of their neck, and they just don't want to proceed with that. They don't like you after you do that to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, what ends up happening is that your house sits. It loses all of its momentum in the marketplace in a fast moving market, David, like we're in where homes are selling in two to three weeks or even faster. If your home sits on the market for two to three weeks with no offers, you know, gosh, I'm sorry, it's already a stale listing. Like you've already missed the boat. You've missed the market momentum. And now you're dropping the price, dropping the price. You're kind of chasing the market down. You're racking up uh, days on market and the property just continues to appear less and less appealing and attractive. People think you don't know what you're doing. Something must be wrong with the house. It just it tends to not work as well as striking the right price at the beginning. Um, for people who are eager to sell, maybe they have a tight timeline. They're doing a buy, sell. They need to get the property sold. I have a client right now who has a new construction home under contract. He has a home sale contingency on that and he needs to have a buyer in place on his home in the next 30 days. He wanted to come in with kind of like a high price. And I said, no, <laughs> if anything, you know, you want to come in on a low price in that scenario, David, so that you can get two or three people interested, attract multiple offers potentially, and your home will come up to market price. If you leave it on at a low price and you only get one offer, well, guess what? That wasn't really a low price. That was more of the market price. So I just think that it's really important for people to understand the psychology behind this. And it's not necessarily what we think, um, but it, it is it is very data driven and also trend driven. But the biggest factor is getting it right at the beginning, because you're going to get the most people looking at it in the first two weeks. And after that, it's just leftovers.
Yeah, that's a really good point because when buyers that I'm working with that are pre-approved are looking at a home and they see a price drop and a price drop and a price drop, their motivation is stops. Not as not in buying the home, but some people will think, oh, I just dropped the price. That's that's what I'll take. The buyers don't look at it from that perspective. They say, oh, OK, it's there. Now I can start negotiating where I want to. Right. It's right. blood in the water, right? The sharks. Exactly. So like, there's two sides of that from that perspective. And the buyers are not. Everything's transparent. Everybody has access to this information. It's not like it's a secret. Right. So, yeah, that's a really good point. So hopefully you've learned from a lot of the things that we've talked about. Uh, I want to thank Emily for being part of this. And we really want you to set up a one on one. Either of us, both of us, whatever's best for you. But let's talk about your specific needs and what's important to you. So hopefully you're feeling a little better than perhaps when we started. Um, Emily, do you want to go ahead? Whoops. Do you want to go ahead and um, have some closing remarks? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, David, the thing that I would like to convey to people is that Yes, this is a fairly complicated process. We've given you an overview of what some of the major factors are. Hopefully we've busted a few myths out there and helped reset some expectations, helped highlight some of the things that are going to be a challenge. But also it's important to know that you don't have to do it alone. As so many, I, I just, I feel like this is a Seattle thing and I was born and raised in Seattle. So I'm, I'm very much like this too. There's a, kind of an analytical, do it yourself, figure it out. Like I have to be the smart one that knows all of the answers to all of these questions so that I can make a smart decision. And I just want, if that's you, if you're another person like me who feels that way, I want to speak to you right now and just say that David and I are here to guide you through this. We do this day in and day out and have for years. And there are a lot of moving pieces. There are a lot of different options. There are a lot of decision points and you don't have to have figured it all out by yourself. I appreciate the fact that you're here and that you're educating yourself. David and I will be continuing to educate you as you go through this process, but it becomes a lot easier to attain that information when we can go specifically into your scenario rather than keeping it kind of general and broad because you know a variety of different people are in are listening to this. So like David said, the more overwhelmed you feel, I think the more relieved you will become when you have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. We're here to help you, you know, whether or not you're ready to do something right now is not the point at all. Uh, we're here to guide you through the process as long as it takes, no matter how early you you are in your decision-making time.